Changes are on the way for local restaurants. San Diego City leaders approve a styrofoam ban, saying it's needed to help the environment. The political class, like my opponent, will just talk a good game. They'll say, we're going to give you this, we're going to give you that. What I want to do is give people opportunity. KPBS interviews John Cox about his campaign for governor and why he's focusing on affordability in the final weeks. We create a sports entertainment district, we bring Major League Soccer to town, and we build and maintain a river park. Turning Mission Valley into Soccer City, that's the promise of Measure E. Supporters tell KPBS why they feel it's the best plan for the stadium site. And a new exodus. Another large caravan is heading north from Honduras. How the group already has the attention of President Trump. KPBS Evening Edition starts right now. Good evening and thanks for joining us. I'm Ebony Monet. In three weeks, voters will choose California's next governor. Recently, KPBS reporter Amitha Sharma interviewed Gavin Newsom. Tonight, we have her interview with John Cox with a focus on affordability and the California dream. Well, it's interesting because my mom went to school in California, and so I always heard from my mom about how California had the best schools, the best business uh, opportunities. Uh, it was the California dream of being able to rise from the bottom and make it your way to the top. And, you know, I, I would say that now that dream is, is almost gone for a lot of people. Uh, the, uh, the amount of regulation in government, uh, the amount of tax burden that's being put uh, on people, the uh, interest groups have driven up uh, the cost of living and made it almost impossible to get started here. Describe what that dream means to you today. Well, I, th I think it means doing what I did, and that is starting at the bottom. Uh, my mom was a school teacher in Chicago, and making it your, your, your success, making your life a success. And that's the way to cure inequality. Uh, the politicians, the political class likes to talk, like my opponent, likes to talk about the, bridging this inequality. And the trouble is that what they're doing in Sacramento is making that inequality worse by making it so much more difficult to get a good education to start a business or to work for a small business. I'm a small businessman and you know, being able to work for a small business or start a small business is the best way to get yourself started in life and grow uh, and, and ex achieve success. As you said, you're a businessman, you're a lawyer, you're an investor who's never held public office. How do you relate to the nearly half of all Californians who are struggling with poverty today? Because I solve problems and deliver results. The political class, like my opponent, will just talk a good game. They'll say, we're going to give you this, we're going to give you that. What I want to do is give people opportunity, uh, have the opportunities for growth uh, and to be able to be a success, and also to have things made more affordable. The cost of housing has been driven up to ridiculous levels, and it's mostly government that's done that. The lawsuits, the impact fees, the regulations, the red tape. Those are the things that are holding back people from living a wonderful life, and that's what I'm going to try to change. Let's talk about housing. You've discussed the affordability crisis in California yeah. a great deal. What is your specific plan to make houses more affordable to buy and apartments more affordable to rent? I build in other states for a fraction of what it costs to build apartments here. And the difference, lawsuits, red tape, taxes. My opponent's answer is to hand out a few subsidies to a few people. That is only going to save a few people. It is not going to provide wonderful, affordable housing to millions. We literally have millions of people who are living in a lot less than the desirable places. They, they, small apartments, small houses. People can't even afford to buy a house these days, and they're well, well, moving to other your, states. What's your specific plan? Streamline the regulations, end the frivolous litigation and lawsuits, uh, shorten the approval process. Now it takes five different uh, agencies to approve a housing project. I want local control, but I want the process streamlined so that you don't have to go through a million different steps to get something approved. Do you support more density? 
in certain spots, that could be the case. But I don't want to take away the dream of having a house and a yard for people. Uh, we need to get away from limiting urban environments and maybe expand out. You know, California still only builds on about 5% of the available land in this state, so I think we have plenty of room for expansion. What role, if any, should government play in getting the 134,000 homeless people in this state off the streets? Whose responsibility is it? It's political leadership and a lack of political will. We need to give people the opportunity to get off of substance abuse, get treated for mental illness, and to have a chance in an affordable house. One in five people in California lives in poverty. What is your strategy to help them? Reduce the cost of living. Make it so that we can build affordable housing. If I can build for one-fifth the cost in another state, we can do it here and still make sure that it's good housing and environmentally safe. You know, the reason that people are living in poverty is because the cost of living, a dozen eggs is four dollars in San Diego. It's two dollars in Phoenix. There's no reason why we should be charging people so much money and, and it's about the cost of doing business here. Our electricity rates are the highest in the country. Our water bills are incredibly high, when, even if it's available. Gasoline is outrageous. We need to bring the cost down. Only 47 percent of Californians believe the American dream, the California dream of economic opportunity for hard work still holds true. Can that dream be saved? Absolutely. We just need the political leadership to change. The status quo in Sacramento is not working. We can see that in the numbers of people who are being pounded in the, into poverty. Our school system is 47th in the nation now, near the bottom. We have got to make sure that we have the leadership, and it's all because of interest groups in Sacramento and the political class. There's got to be a change. I'm going to be that change agent because I know what it's like to struggle. I started at the bottom. My opponent was given everything by a billionaire. He was put in business by a billionaire. He was put in politics by a billionaire. I had a struggle, so I know what it's like, and I want to make sure that other people don't have to struggle. As we mentioned earlier, KPBS also spoke at length with Gavin Newsom about his campaign and vision for California. You can watch the interview on our website, kpbs.org. Tomorrow, Senate candidates Dianne Feinstein and Kevin DeLeon will discuss the issues together on stage. The event is described as a political forum and not a formal debate. It will be hosted by the Public Policy Institute of California in San Francisco. KPBS Radio will have live coverage of the forum. You can listen tomorrow during KPBS Midday Edition starting at noon. This week, part of our election coverage includes in, an in-depth look at plans for the Mission Valley Stadium site. We start with Measure E, which centers around bringing professional soccer to San Diego. KPBS reporter Eric Anderson has a story. Ladies and gentlemen, the Chargers, thank you for your support all season long. The timing in 2017 couldn't have been better. The sting of losing the Chargers NFL franchise to Los Angeles was still fresh, and the news cut deep for San Diego County Supervisor Ron Roberts. You know, this, <laughs> I hate this day. You know, it's just, uh, it, for me and my family, it's a big thing. Thank you everybody for joining us today. A short while later at a hastily convened news event, FS Investor spokesman Nick Stone went public with the plan to make professional soccer the impetus for a complete reshaping of the Mission Valley Stadium site. And we're really excited to start to talk about bringing a lot more professional soccer to town. Months of private discussions between FS investors, Mayor Kevin Faulkner, and San Diego State University officials were finally out in the open. With the Chargers gone, the redevelopment project was in play. Investors and the mayor greeted soccer-hungry fans on the deck of the USS Midway in early 2017 and announced the pursuit of an MLS team. We are a city that looks forward. We are a city that innovates. We are a city that recognizes 
rising tides. A soccer stadium is a requirement to land a major league soccer team, and the aging Mission Valley facility is both too big and too old. The Soccer City plan calls for a new multi-sport stadium that would seat between 24 and 34,000 fans. It could also host the SDSU Aztec football team. FS investors hope the school would share the cost of building the stadium in exchange for ownership of the facility in five years. They also had a plan to give the university access to land so the school could expand in Mission Valley. We've talked with FS for you know, probably going on two years. Uh, have had discussions with the mayor on what is important to San Diego State University, and that's not just a football stadium. John David Wicker is San Diego State University's athletic director. He said those talks did not go well, and by May, the school had ended negotiations, citing irreconcilable differences. That divorce didn't stop the push to get the more than 3,000-page Soccer City measure on the ballot quickly. Please hear our voice and adopt the soccer plan. Soccer fans packed city council chambers, asking for a special election in the fall of 2017. Those pleas were unpersuasive. In the end, the council demurred. Soccer City would get on the ballot, but not until this year. The Soccer City project encountered more headwinds from the San Diego City Attorney's Office. Mara Elliott questioned whether the initiative overstepped its authority, and she asked a judge to remove the measure from the fall ballot. The courts declined that request. Hey, you want to see the future? Yeah. Nick Stone says soccer is the focal point of the multi-billion dollar redevelopment plan that seeks to create a sports and entertainment district in Mission Valley. Would we have rather it happened a long time ago? Sure. But, you know, th the great part is we now have a chance to communicate with the average voter and say here's why this is so much better for the city. Stone says their project is unprecedented. FS investors would tear down the existing stadium and push to have a new multi-sport stadium built quickly. And there are still two possible Major League Soccer franchises available. Not only is the sport great, it's the first time that somebody's come forward with a proposal for that site that adds a sport and doesn't cost the taxpayer anything. And that is such a rare distinction relative to what people are used to. Soccer City proposes paying for the new facility by developing the rest of the site and the old Chargers Park just north of there. The plan calls for the construction of 4,800 homes, with some being affordable. There is retail, commercial, and office space. In addition, the plan has money for a river park, hotel, and even land set aside if an NFL team wants a stadium site within five years. An independent analysis by the Regional Economic Development Corporation found the Soccer City proposal would have an annual $2.8 billion impact on the region's economy, that comes along with 26,000 permanent jobs. And an analysis by the San Diego Taxpayers Association found the Soccer City plan would generate more money for the city of San Diego than the SDSU West plan, which is also on the ballot. And by the way, we add something that's fun and exciting. We create a sports entertainment district, we bring Major League Soccer to town, and we build and maintain a river park. In order to prevail, Measure E will have to get at least 50% of the vote and more votes than SDSU West's Measure G which proposes selling a portion of the stadium site to San Diego State University. Both measures could also fail. Eric Anderson, KPBS News. Tomorrow, we'll look at the competing plan, Measure G. KPBS is a service of San Diego State University. NPR has independently reviewed this story for balance. Our news partner, iNews Source, is following the money. Jill Castellano has a look at how the political parties are using their resources in the race for county supervisor. The San Diego County Democratic Party has spent more than $1.7 million on local races in the upcoming election. That's compared to about $560,000 spent by the county Republican Party. The Democrats are spending more than they did in the last election because they think they have a chance to win seats Republicans have held for decades. The race that has attracted the most cash? The contest to replace termed out County Supervisor Ron Roberts. He's held his central San Diego seat on the all Republican Board of Supervisors for 24 years. The Democratic Party has spent more than $1 million to help their supervisor candidate, Nathan Fletcher. His Republican challenger, Bonnie Dumanis, has gotten about $200,000 from her party. University of San Diego political science professor Casey Dominguez says political parties can have a big influence on voters. 
parties are more important than ever right now because most voters have made up their minds to support candidates in one party or the other. And what parties do is get those voters to the polls. And if um, one party is doing a better job of getting its voters to the polls, then its candidates will be more likely to win. So will all this party spending work? We'll find out on November 6th. For KPBS, I'm my news source reporter, Jill Castellano. iNews Source is an independently funded nonprofit partner of KPBS. Styrofoam containers will soon be banned from restaurants in San Diego. KPBS Metro reporter Andrew Bowen has details on the city council decision. Polystyrene foam, or styrofoam, does not biodegrade. Instead, it breaks into tiny pieces that pollute the waterways and beaches, and sometimes wildlife mistake it for food. That's why environmental advocates called on the council to approve the ban, which goes into effect next year. The ordinance originated from Councilman Chris Ward's office. He says the economy has to transition away from single-use plastic products. Eliminating styrofoam food wear from our waste stream benefits both our environment and human health. Doing so can and should be and has been done with our restaurants and small businesses in mind. Opponents of the ban included the chemical industry that produces styrofoam and some small business owners who were concerned about the added costs of ordering new takeout containers. The city will allow small business owners to apply for a two-year waiver from the ban in case of economic hardship. Andrew Bowen, KPBS News. I'm Amna Nawaz. Tonight on the News Hour, Secretary of State Pompeo meets with the Saudi king for answers on what happened to a prominent journalist. Coming up at 7, right after Evening Edition on KPBS. NPR has announced a leadership change. Nancy Barnes was named today as NPR's Senior Vice President for News and Editorial Director. Barnes is currently the Executive Editor at the Houston Chronicle and led the paper to its first Pulitzer Prize. She will join NPR next month. Barnes replaces Michael Oreskes. He resigned last year amid accusations of sexual harassment. The wind continues to be an issue in parts of East County, raising the risk for wildfires. Erin Calandra has details in tonight's forecast. We are still under a red flag warning that's until 8 o'clock tonight in those interior parts of the county. The Santa Ana winds, they are still ripping up to 60 miles per hour through the canyons and the passes. Be careful driving. It's going to be gusty, so both hands on the steering wheel. And we could even see some power outages because of these winds. It's also driving up our temperatures. So temperatures in San Diego right now about 10 degrees warmer than it should be. Here's the satellite. We don't really have much going on in California. A couple of uh, showers, maybe even a touch of snow across the mountains of Arizona. But we are quiet in San Diego County. No rain uh, across the region. And the temperatures tonight in Oceanside at 48. Chula Vista at 57, Borrego Springs right around 55, Mount Laguna at 40 with clear skies. We have an offshore flow because of those winds, so clouds are going to be far and few between. 61 tonight in the metro, nice and clear. When you wake up, you're not really going to see the typical cloud coverage we normally see uh, right along the coast. Oceanside, plenty of sunshine at 79, San Diego at 80. Again, well above average temperatures. Borrego Springs at 83, Mount Laguna 58 with beautiful sun. This is what it looks like for the late week. Nice, dry, sunshine, beautiful conditions that we're used to. Here is uh, the five day for the coast. Expect to see lots of sunshine. Temperatures again on the rise throughout the week. We'll reach those mid 80s by Friday. By Sunday, just a little bit cooler, 78, very pleasant. Inland, it's going to stay sunny and warm by Friday. We're talking 90 degrees, and that will be the case through Saturday before temperatures drop on Sunday. In the mountains, it'll be breezy. Again, be careful on the those highways. It's going to be a bit gusty at times with temperatures in those mid 60s and in the deserts. It's going to be sunny with our temperatures in those mid 80s reaching 89 by Saturday. Our lows mainly in the 50s and low 60s. For KPBS News, I'm Erin Calandra. Back to you.
And today, health officials, advocates, and law enforcement joined forces in Mission Valley to release a new federal report showing the growing impact of marijuana. Some of the highlights of the report, marijuana-related drug driving fatalities in San Diego County have increased more than 50 percent over the last dozen years. During the same time, emergency room visits from marijuana-related trauma have spiked more than 600 percent. Both trends are expected to increase as the result as a result of the legalization of the drug. David King, director of the San Diego and Imperial County High Intensity Drug Traffic Area Program, says marijuana usage rates among youth in California are the highest in the nation. More seventh graders, eighth graders, ninth graders, and 11th graders are smoking marijuana more than they are cigarettes. And obviously everybody knows the harm associated with cigarettes and the long-term health consequences, but these kids are being told, hey, it's not harmful for you because it's medicine. King says youth ages 12 to 17 make up the largest percentage of people seeking treatment for marijuana. Hundreds of Hondurians are making their way to the U.S. together. They say they're fleeing violence and poverty. It's the second caravan to capture President Trump's attention. KPBS Fronteras reporter Jean Guerrero has the story. The mass exodus started last Friday from San Pedro Sula, with people traveling by foot, hitchhiking, and hopping on buses. The caravan was organized in part by a former Honduran lawmaker named Bartolo Fuentes. He's been posting Facebook Live videos along the way, talking about the bloodshed and the hunger that people are fleeing. Entonces, señor Trump. Fuentes called out President Trump for supporting the Honduran government, which he called corrupt. Last year, the U.S. gave Honduras millions of dollars to fund its military and to purchase weapons from the U.S. And then, on Tuesday morning, Trump went on Twitter and told the Honduran government to stop the caravan, threatening to revoke aid. Fuentes was arrested by Guatemalan police that same morning, according to local media reports. But most in the caravan continue their trek north. I spoke to Alex Mensing of Pueblo Sin Fronteras, a migrant rights group that has organized caravans in the past. They're not organizing this caravan, but may help them once they reach Mexico. Mensing says it's contradictory for the U.S. to try to stop this caravan from reaching its southwest border. The current state of structural violence that causes people to have to abandon their homes in Central America is the direct result of impunity, corruption, intervention um, by, by the local governments and uh, the U.S. government. The migrant caravan left a day after U.S. Vice President Mike Pence urged the presidents of Central American countries to persuade their citizens not to leave their countries. Jean Guerrero, KPBS News. Cal State San Marcos and Oceanside's Miracosta College will receive a grant to help undocumented students. The colleges are among 32 schools sharing $10 million in funding over a three-year period. It's called the Uprise Grant. Money will be used to help undocumented students with legal assistance, mental health care, and cultural events. At the request of the Trump administration, California National Guard troops have been at the border since April. KPBS military reporter Steve Walsh has a behind-the-scenes look at the controversial decision to send them there. California has offered only occasional updates since April. After Governor Jerry Brown agreed to send troops in support of the Trump administration's Operation Guardian Support, KPBS recently received a series of emails from the state which showed that California wanted to keep a low profile from the very beginning. Guidance from the governor's office asked other members of the administration to limit their comments to the media, even after the president tweeted, the crime rate in California is high enough and the federal government will not be paying for Governor Brown's charade. Publicly, California held its fire. Behind the scenes, Mark Gellarducci, the head of California Emergency Services, exclaimed in an email to other top staffers, this guy, unfriggin' believable. Since April, the Guard has kept a low profile. Unlike operations under Bush and Obama, there have been no offers to see the California Guardsmen in action. They're not supposed to enforce immigration law. Back in April, the leading candidate for governor, Lieutenant Governor Gavin Newsom, said he would not be there at all, preferring to reserve the Guard for wildfires and other state missions. I would have approached it fundamentally differently. How but would you, Why would you not have done it? Because I don't, I think that the 
National Guard should be focusing on the next two, three earthquakes. California recently decided to stay in Operation Guardian support for another six months, even as other states have opted out in protest over the Trump administration policy to separate families at the border. Steve Walsh, KPBS News. Here's a look at what we're working on for tomorrow in the KPBS newsroom. On Morning Edition, a closer look at California's Prop 2. It's a plan to address homelessness and mental health, but will voters approve the $2 billion price tag? And a reminder, KPBS Radio will have live coverage of the Senate Candidates Forum in San Francisco. That's tomorrow during Midday Edition. You can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks for joining us. Have a great night.